in the uh, that this will be recorded. That will enable others to enjoy the wisdom shared today. And Esther, just give me a signal or note when I should start with intros. I'll hold off for your signal. We are good to go, Peter. Terrific. All right, we'll get started then. Uh, so I'm Peter Gray here in CBC C120 on, uh, on campus. This is a hybrid event. And we are delighted today to host a virtual UNLV anthropology panel entitled From Anthropology BA to the Broader World, a UNLV alumni panel exploration of career possibilities with an anthropology BA degree. This is an especially salient topic for any undergraduate anthropology students who might be attending, but also for graduate students and faculty to contemplate the broader relevance and potential impact of anthropology. Who are our four panelists, all of whom received UNLV Anthropology BA degrees? Dean Balan is Associate Music Director for Vegas City Opera and is currently the Associate Conductor for the Broadway National Tour of The Prom. He just relocated to New York days ago and so joins us from the East Coast. You might also recognize him from a, from a UNLV Anthropology video appearing on the department homepage. Dean earned a graduate degree in music too and can speak to various professional pathways, including the arts. Christina Magdaleno Gonzalez is a teacher at Mac Middle School here in Las Vegas. Many UNLV anthropology graduates both graduated from and teach in public schools, particularly within the Clark County School District. This means that Christina's message about teaching will resonate with many, and she can also comment on licensure processes, i.e., what do you need to do to become a teacher? Tara Ratner enjoyed her UNLV Anthropology BA experience so much, she decided to stick around and also earn an MA in Anthropology at UNLV. She's held positions in several archaeology firms, such as Far West Anthropological Research Group, in museums such as the San Diego Archaeological Center, in government, including the United States Forest Service, and oversees her own business, Archaeology for Kids. Natasha Tuisi had her time in Lesotho as a Peace Corps volunteer cut short in spring 2020 due to COVID-19, so she returned to Las Vegas and worked for the Southern Nevada Health District. Just this past month, she moved to Colorado to begin an MPH program in global health epidemiology at the CU Anschutz Medical Campus. Thank you, Dean, Christina, Kara, and Natasha for joining us today. Each of you has been asked to share your respective story and advice in seven to 10 minutes. For our in-person and virtual audience, please submit questions via chat. Our panelists may address some questions as they arise, though we'll hold off generally on most discussion towards the end to ensure enough time to hear from all four of our alumni. We turn the stage over appropriately to Dean. So Dean, we expect some song and dance now. I'm so sorry to disappoint. Uh, I, I've only prepared my, my little talking points, but I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Gray. A uh, special thanks to Dr. Gray and Esther and the whole department for inviting all four of us back and to for bringing this panel to life. So I did have some uh, some slides I prepared to share, but I'm having a little trouble with the share function. So uh, if it's all right with everyone, I'll just plug along and please stop me if you have any questions. So uh, just a little bit of context, as Dr. Gray mentioned, I am a pianist and an orchestra conductor now, uh, but I, I was a, a student at UNLV and earned a bachelor's in anthropology and then a, a Master of Music in Conducting uh, from the University of Cincinnati. I've worked in ballet and opera now, but I specialize more in musical theater, Broadway type stuff. And this fall, I will be the associate conductor for a show called The Prom, which you mentioned. And that just means I'll play piano for rehearsals, I'll play uh, piano in the orchestra, and I'll conduct the show a couple times a week. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, but for our discussion today, I'd like to start by giving uh, just a little bit more of a brief personal history and a few anecdotes. And then I'll use those stories to illustrate a few ideas, some important ones. And lastly, I'd like to share just some resources, uh, some books, questions, essays that I hope will be useful to people, uh, whether they're an under undergrad or not. So, um, and just so there's no confusion about what my point is at the end, uh, my big idea for today is that what you do matters much less than how you do it. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. So just a little uh, brief background on myself. I grew up in Henderson, just outside of Las Vegas. When I got to UNLV, 
I started as a pre-med biochemistry major. And after about three and a half weeks of that, I said, thank you, but no, thank you. And I made my way over to the anthropology department and I never looked back. I was very happy with that decision. Uh, and I cherished my time as a UNLV anthropology student. Uh, but I mentioned being pre-med because being pre-med guided a lot of my decisions during college. In terms of classes, I focused on topics like evolutionary medicine with Dr. Gray, medical anthropology with Dr. Benishek, uh, health and disease and antiquity with Dr. Martin. I joined the Honors College. Uh, I, I earned a bio minor. I joined AMSA, the American Medical Student Association. I volunteered at hospitals. I shadowed physicians. Uh, I even volunteered abroad and, and shadowed abroad. I did all these things that you're supposed to do when you think you're going to medical school. Uh, but clearly, I, I did not go to medical school. Uh, I, I'm speaking to you today as a music director MD and not a medicine doctor MD. So what, what happened? Well, uh, the answer to that question entails some important ideas, I think, for, for people who are in the middle of their undergraduate career or just after and some considerations that I wanted to share with you today. So uh, lesson one. It's important to see for yourself. Uh, I mentioned all those things I did as a pre-med undergraduate. And the reason I'm not a big part of the reason I'm not a doctor today is because I spent that time in the field, so to speak. I, I was around physicians, nurses, uh, respiratory techs, x-ray techs, and I got to talk to them. I, and I, I, I heard what their frustrations were, what their satisfactions were. And I admired them greatly, but at the end of the day, I decided that those problems were not for me. So if you're, if you're a grad student, if you're an undergrad, college is the perfect time to go out and try on these different roles. If you're interested in becoming a teacher, for example, go observe a classroom or find a really cool teacher who will let you guest lecture. Try it on while the stakes are low and, and see what the day in, day out is really like instead of just rolling with whatever your ideas are. Treat it like participant observation. No judgments, no, uh, no unaddressed explicit assumptions. Just come in and pay attention to what is different than what you expected. Um, an important question that I mentioned earlier, talk to people who do what you think you wanna do and ask them, what are the frustrations that you have day in and day out? What are the problems you're dealing with? The good stuff tends to take care of itself, but I find that it's important to have an idea of what problems you want to be dealing with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the first lesson, um, to go see for yourself. The second lesson I'd like to share is that passion is not a strong place to start. It might even be the wrong place to start. Uh, and I'd advise maybe start with learning a skill. Passion is a beautiful thing, but it can be fickle. It can be very malleable. Uh, it's hard to use that as a criterion for your career or as the central criterion. From my own observation, passion comes from satisfaction and fulfillment in doing work that has a positive impact on other people from knowing that you can do something that not everyone else can. You have a unique contribution. A lot of people assume that because I work in the arts, uh, I was just passionate about music and that's why I'm a musician. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love music. It's a lot of fun. It's very gratifying and, and introduces you to wonderful people, but I was not passionate about music coming in. I had a teacher when I was younger, around high school age, who got me started with, uh, with some workable skills. And she referred me to some schools and some churches. And then once word got around that I was reliable, and I had a skill set, I got more calls. Uh, and as I improved my skill set, the calls became more frequent and the pay got better. So it's not that I am not passionate about music now, but it didn't start there. Uh, and I think that kind of story can happen for anybody. So find a skill, find a way to, to provide a need, to uh, service a need. And if you are good at it, you will, you will work if that's what you'd like to do. Um, and now that I've talked a little bit about passion and how it's not the best place to start, let me temper that with lesson three, which is don't underestimate the power of I like. Passion isn't a great place to start, 
but it is supremely important to pay attention to what you sincerely and genuinely capital L like. I'm not talking about your favorite ice cream flavor, but rather uh, your, your innate proclivities, the things you can't help doing or being. So maybe genetics and evolution is really boring for you, but you can and have spent hours a day poring over medieval manuscripts and scans from like the Yale archives or something. Uh, if you have that in you and it's just a, a genuine interest, cultivate that. See who could use that innate skill. As I promise you, it is very, very hard to outwork people who are basing their work on that innate drive. Uh, it's, and then even if you don't end up doing that for yourself explicitly, it's important to be aware of the things that drive you that can influence your choices in your career and your education. So don't underestimate that innate part of yourself. Uh, the last lesson I wanted to share is to play the long game. Whether or not you're going to be an anthropologist in the future, now in your studies is a time to use your anthro major to broaden and cultivate yourself. Take advantage of our world-class department. It's I've traveled a lot now. We have a really, really great anthropology department. Um, and actively seek out classes and topics that interest you that are outside of the department too. Uh, just for your curiosity's sake, pay attention to what sparks you a little bit. For me, studying anthropology gave a deep appreciation for people whose stories are very different than mine. Um, and it turns out that that has been fundamental in my work in musical theater telling stories of people who are so not like me on the surface. Um, during my undergrad, I also delved into folklore and mythology, and that turned out to be very important when I was working on ballets and opera that were based on those folk myths. So take advantage of where you are now at UNLV, you've got time. Uh, and another element of playing the long game is maintaining your health and your relationships. I won't say too much in the specifics here, other than that it's much, much easier to establish habits and routines in your late teens and early 20s than it is 10, 20 years hence. So, you know, as you're reflecting, ask yourself, if I behaved every day the way that I had today, if I treated people the way I treated people today all the time, what will my life look like after 10 years of that, 20 years of that? Um, play the long game. Uh, the last thing I wanted to share with you, which I had a cool slide for, are just some resources, things that helped me when I was wrestling with what to do and how to do it. Um, on the slide, I have a, a list of books. I think I'll put them in the chat so it's easier to, um, to kind of keep track of. But I do want to mention a couple of essays. The first is How to Do What You Love by Paul Graham, who is a, a polymath. Uh, and a co-founder of Y Combinator, who, which is like a, a startup development lab, basically for like Airbnb. And um, the essay is called How to Do What You Love from Paul Graham. If you look up at Paul, P-A-U-L-G, golf, um, you'll find the essay How to Do What You Love. The other essay I wanted to mention is How to Find a Career That Actually Fits You by Tim Urban. The website is called Wait But Why, and he is a writer and a blogger um, who did a very famous profile of Elon Musk and Tesla a few years ago. Uh, how to pick a career that actually fits you. Excuse me, that's the title. So those are the two essays I wanted to mention. Uh, I'll put the books in the chat, um, but two I want to mention and emphasize. The first one is How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big by Scott Adams which speaks to exactly that, how to fail at everything and still come out with net good. So author is Scott Adams, creator of Dilbert. Uh, and the other book I wanted to mention is So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Uh, both of those books, by the way, I would recommend for, for someone who isn't sure yet what they want to do and are just looking for different ways of thinking about how to move forward. So uh, my last thing, just a brief recap, my lessons for today were to uh, see for yourself. Passion is the wrong place to start, learn a skill, 
don't underestimate the power of I like and play the long game. So I believe uh, that's me on time. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you, Dean, for those inspiration. My pleasure. We are no longer echoing. Excellent. Um, yeah, thank you for those inspirational words. We're now going to turn it over to Christina. And Christina, I just want to also say how salient your message is. I talked to a recent UNLV BA alum who wanted to go into teaching. And once he described the licensure process, it was like a mystery behind the scene, behind the curtains, you know, Wizard of Oz type stuff. And uh, yet more of our alums go into teaching than probably any other profession. No offense, Dean, uh, on Broadway and such. Uh, so uh, we're delighted now to turn it over to Christina. Right. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I do have a presentation. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see everyone. I recognize a lot of my former professors here. Um, so it's definitely awesome. Um, like uh, Dr. Gray said, I am a middle school teacher. I teach here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm a special education teacher um, in middle school, which means I work with students who have mild to moderate uh, disabilities, um, anything from uh, reading uh, deficits, uh, ADHD, um, mild to moderate autism. Uh, I work with those students. Um, and I just, I love it. It's, I wouldn't trade it for, for the world. Um, I did receive my BA uh, from UNOVI for, in anthropology in 2013. And then I also have my master's in special education uh, generalist. Um, and I received that at, in, at, in 2017 at UNOVI. Um, so my road to teaching. So this is how I feel the having a BA in anthropology um, helped me. Um, it really helped me understand uh, diverse groups of people. Um, I work with a wide range of students, um, not only disabilities, um, but also socioeconomic status um, and just different cultures. Um, and so it gave me a better perspective on how to how to how to work with with different types of people. Um, it also gave me an opportunity to identify, uh, to use my research skills that, that I learned um, or how to read good research papers and, and break them down and, and really, anal really analyzing them. Um, it gave me those skills to be able to find evidence-based practices. So when I'm making implementation for some of my students, um, what are the best ways of teaching that have been proven by evidence? Um, and then lastly, it also helped me with um, seeing education through a different lens. Um, education, there's there's different camps of, of, of thinking when it comes to education, um, like K through 12. And so for, for me, it's most that, for me, children are part of a community and I see the child as a whole. And I think um, having that background in anthropology helped me see things just a little bit different compared to my peers that just went from just education and that's all they did. They just went from education um, for their bachelors. Um, so I, I have a different perspective because of it and uh, I'm, I'm really thankful. Um, so my interest, so I also started with, with a passion of wanting to work with people and learning about different cultures. So after I graduated from high school, uh, I things fit within anthropology, so I was like, okay, I'll go ahead and, and enroll in the anthropology degree. But as I went through the program, I really didn't see myself as uh, someone that would go into academia or the traditional path for, for anthropology. So I was a little bit uh, far into the into the, the major when I when I realized this. So I I thought, okay, maybe I'll just finish up. Um, and and because if I were to just start over again, it would be more costly. And um, so I just decided to just finish and graduate with my degree. Um, and it's totally okay to change your mind as you're growing older and as you're growing wiser. Um, you're gonna change your mind. You're gonna discover things about yourself. So it's totally fine. Um, 
So, like I said, I graduated with my BA in anthropology in 2013. Um, after that, I started working at a local nonprofit um, that helps adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, it was there where I actually found my passion and my calling for teaching. Um, I realized that I had the, the, the natural ability to teach and be patient. And, and I also found that I, I enjoy teaching others how to advocate for themselves. And that was one of the big things that propelled me to go into education because um, I saw a lot of adults that, that went through different things and I spoke with them. And it made me feel that maybe education or being a teacher would be a good way to teach those skills earlier on so that things wouldn't get as bad or as they, they, the, the adults would learn how to, how to speak for themselves and, and, and really share what they what it is that they needed so if we could i could go back into when they were younger and teach them how to do that um that i i, I felt that education would be the best way to to accomplish it um so i went ahead and uh, one of my friends actually told me that he um he was thinking of doing the ARL program so the alternative right to licensure program um just because nevada has a teacher shortage and so they were in desperate need for science teachers, math teachers, and special education teachers. So I thought, well, that's great. I, I'll go ahead and, and, and apply um, because I, I wanted to make an impact and I, I, I wanted to make a difference. And so that was my, that was my calling. Um, so I went ahead and I enrolled in the, in the UNLV ARL program. Um, so this is, so if you're interested in becoming a teacher, um, it might depend on, on where you're at with your major, um, but first for this, for the, the route that I went through, I already had my bachelor's. So you you need to have your bachelor's already and um, you then you enroll and you actually enroll in graduate level classes in the education uh, program in the education department. I had to complete um, three introductory classes um, make sure that you pass those and you're, then you have to do a 45 hour practicum. Um, so what I did is I knew I wanted to work in special education. So what my mentor did was, um, was they put me, they placed me in an elementary, not, not elementary, in a middle school. Um, and they, they had me observe all the different special education programs that the, 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 that CCSD has. So I pretty much saw everything. And then I realized that I was better suited for working with mild to moderate uh, disabilities. So that's why I went into the generalist route for that. Um, there's different routes that you can go, but I feel that that's where my skill set was, was better fit, was a better fit for. Um, you also need to pass the practice score. It's just, it's just a test for you to be able to to show that you know basic knowledge um, since you're going to be a teacher. Um, the next thing was um, I after you're you're done with with the basic requirements, um, then you're you're required to stay enrolled in the uh, Masters of Education program. So you're supposed to take three classes per semester while also working full time as a as a teacher. So it's kind of hard. It's it's difficult. I'm not, I'm not going to lie, um, but um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, you you have to take those classes as part of the program, and it it's it's it goes by really really fast, and you have to really be on on it um, because it takes four semesters to be able to complete that program. But by the end of it, you have a master's degree, um, and your full licensure, uh, so you'll be able to teach in the state of Nevada. Um, there is some additional class requirements. Um, if you would like to, to let's say you're, you want to move uh, to another state and you would still like to teach, um, there's some additional coursework, uh, but that would be something that you talked with um, whoever's running the program. So that's more focused on, on their program. So I cannot speak too much about that, but there is an additional requirement. Um, and you have to pass the comprehensive exam in order to graduate. So instead of writing a dissertation um, for your master's, 
um, I, you just have to pass a comprehensive exam and it just covers everything that you learn from, um, from the four semesters of, of classes. Um, so getting hired as an eight-year-old teacher. So you complete your basic training, your first three classes, you pass your exam, and you are able to, you get your certificate to say that you, that you, that you pass your background check and all of that. So you, it, it helps um, to, to look around, try different, talk to, to other teachers, talk to, to others that are in the education field, um, see where your, where your best, uh, where your personality fits. Because with teaching, it actually also has a lot to do with your own personality and what you're comfortable with. Um, I know that for me, when it came to teaching, I try to do substitute teaching. Um, so I try, while I was working in on my basic requirements, I was also doing substitute teaching. And so I substituted from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. I, I, I tried all grade levels and I realized, quickly realized that kindergarten was not for me. Um, so I, I love middle school. It is, I, I know a lot of people don't like, don't like middle schoolers, but I just love them. They're, they're great and it just fits my personality. So definitely try uh, going for substitute teaching if you're thinking about becoming a teacher. And now um, you, all you need is just to get a fingerprinted and they'll pay for your fingerprints. Um, and I believe that right now, because we're at a shortage, um, you only need your, your high school diploma and maybe some testing, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in teaching, just try substitute teaching, see how it fits, and maybe you'll, you'll make some money, and yeah, if you're, if you're curious. Um, so life as a first year teacher um, was very stressful, but really rewarding. Um, there's a steep learning curve because not only was I learning how to manage a class, uh, teach the curriculum, um, but I was also going to school full time, so I was required to, to take three classes per semester. Um, but there is a lot of support. I, I had three mentors, um, so usually you get two, but I got, I got lucky and I got three, so I got to learn a lot more from others. Um, there's also your program cohort, um, so the people that you start the, the program with, they, you all move together, so you have that, that, that group already built, that support group built. And there's also teacher groups that, that can help you out um, in case you, you do need that support because, um, well, not, not in case you do need the support because teaching is, it's, it's hard. It's, re it's hard, it's rewarding, but it's also hard. Um, so the benefits of teaching was that when I was working on my full licensure, um, I was able to actually get a full, full, Time full time teacher salary and benefits. So four three B. So that's a retirement account. Um, four fifty seven. Um, health insurance. And I also work only for a nine month contract. Um, CCSDS like that. We work on a nine month contract. You can definitely work more, but it just depends. Usually, I take during those months that I'm not working. I either go to. Um, I complete other courses. I do um, other professional development in other. Um, additional stuff or go to conferences, but it, it just to stay updated on the latest um, practices. But I definitely, I think it's it's a benefit. Um, and also after I, I finished my master's in, in education, I actually got a salary increase. So that was, that was pretty nice too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the benefit of, 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 uh, of becoming a teacher. Um, and the reason why I love, well, the reasons why I love being a teacher, um, I'm able to think creatively, um, how to teach the same thing in different ways, um, how to use my research skills. So with, when it comes to evidence-based, uh, teaching, um, how to problem solve, uh, on the spot or just thinking ahead, there's always problems or there's always something to solve, something to figure out. It's, I love it. I love the, the mental work that it, that it takes. It's, it's, it's awesome. Um, and I love to teach my students how to advocate for, how to become their own advocates. Um, that is very, very important for me. That's, that's part of my teaching philosophy to teach students how to, how to speak for themselves. And I, I get to work with the future. Um, teaching is the profession that gets to teach or gets to work with, with everyone. Um, so I, I feel very lucky. I'm very happy um, that I am a teacher and I, 
I'm glad that I started with anthropology because, like I said, it gave me uh, another perspective into into this profession. So I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, if you're interested in teaching, and if you want to talk to, I guess, a veteran teacher now, I've been teaching six years. Um, here's my 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 Gmail. I'll go ahead and share it on the on the chat. And there's some additional resources um, if you're interested in like in becoming a teacher, if there's any questions about licensure or even the ARO program. I know that I saw a question about the, the program, if it was still happening at UNLV. So, yeah, I'll definitely share that on the chat. Um, but, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christina. A fantastic presentation and fantastic to hear your story and passion for teaching and especially a uh, shout out in the past year with COVID being a teacher has probably been no easier uh, or been no harder than the last year. So a uh, shout out to you uh, for all your hard work. Um, we have some questions in chat that we might be able to circle back to at the end. Um, I think you also really nicely addressed and the links there look really helpful too. Uh, we'll now hand it over to Kara. Hello. Alrighty. I'm going to start with just a little video, if that's all right. Share screen. Podcast. Is it sharing right now? Yes. Can I, is it working? All right, then yes. I'm going to hit. Not getting sound, Kara. Oh, goodness. Let's see. Let me try that. All right. Is the sound working now? Not yet. No sound yet? Let's see. I apologize, was the sound working? It wasn't working at all? Not at all. All right. I will, well, that's okay. I can just go on without it. Um, everything else though is working good? My sound is good? Okay, perfect. All right, well, that video was actually just a new story about uh, one of the archeology span programs that I ran in City Heights, which is a very um, diverse neighborhood in San Diego. So if you want, I can send that link out later, but I just thought it'd be fun. My, it was my husband's idea. He's like, you should send that video out there and show it to people. So I said, all right, we'll see if it works. It's okay, it didn't, but either way. So that's actually what I wanted to start with. So I run the, I own my own business, Archaeology for Kids, but I started off in the same position as everyone here. I was an undergraduate uh, and later became a graduate student, but I was actually known, my friends teased me about this. Uh, I was a frink groupie. <laughs> to course after course after course from Liam. And of course, with that kind of relationship, uh, went on to have him as my advisor in graduate school. So I graduated my bachelor's in 2008 and my master's degree in 2011. Um, while I was working as a graduate student, I also worked for the Forest Service. I was getting experience in archeology span uh, worked there as an archaeological technician for a few years while also be a being a graduate assistant. And the plan was really at the time to, um, oh, thank you, thank you, Liam. Uh, the plan was really to go on to get my PhD. Um, I was in a serious relationship with my then boyfriend, now husband, so it got very serious. <laughs> but uh, as I was about to graduate, he you know, I told him, I was like, I want to go to grad. I want to go for my PhD. And he said, that's fine. I'll move with you, but I need a year. He was in his own career. Totally understandable. It has been, you know, he's going to move with me. I can give him a year. Right. And so I was planning to just work for a year. We'll do CRM. I already had experience with it. I was going to work in CRM for a year, apply to UC Santa Barbara, go for my PhD. He and I were going to move together. And, um, my last year of graduate school, while I was working for the Forest Service, I networked like crazy. I met, um, you know, everyone, pretty much everyone who worked in Nevada archeology span at the time, I knew and I was networking with. 
and I got a job offer. I got a job lined up the Monday after my graduation. Super little. I was so excited. I got a grad job all lined up. I worked at that place for four months, got a raise and promotion one week, the next week laid off right in the middle of a project in Beaver, Utah, got told as of tomorrow, you have no job. Pretty devastating. <laughs> I will say, um, I reached out to everyone. I was like, I need a job. I am please. Nobody was hiring, could not get a job in archeology. span Here I was master's degree, a lot of experience in archeology, span field archeology. span um, I also had a lot of experience though in teaching. Uh, when I was a, an undergraduate, I was a preschool dance teacher. I had taken dance classes my whole life and did that as an undergrad. So I actually ended up working as a substitute teacher. And I will say that is great experience, especially if you are going to become a teacher. It is invaluable. I can tell you, I worked there and I also worked as an SAT tutor. Um, I just needed to make enough money to survive and I'm <laughs> working two jobs, six days a week, a lot of times 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So I would work as a substitute teacher and then three o'clock, go over my tutoring job, work from four to eight. Um, pretty exhausting. And, you know, I still, I was like, okay, I can do this. I'm gonna apply for the, you know, PhD program. I met the professor, I stalked her at a conference. She saw me walking out of the bookstore holding her book. I went to the university, I, you know, met everybody. They asked for three letters of recommendation, I gave them four. You know, I retook my GREs. I was all ready. I'm like, I'm gonna get in. I got rejected. <laughs> I was devastated. I called my husband who was at the time, my fiance crying. He thought I was crying so bad. He thought our dog died. Our dog was fine. It was honestly at the time that was kind of my way out of, in my mind, Las Vegas. I, uh, I was born and raised there. I was ready to move. I wanted to go somewhere else. And that just felt crushing here. I was couldn't even work in archeology. span I was, you know, a substitute teacher and an SAT tutor got rejected from the PhD program. When I called them to find out why they said, we had a lot of great candidates. A lot of them had master's degrees. I said, but I had a master's degree. And I called the professor and said, what happened? And she goes, well, you know, I was, I took two students last year and they wouldn't let me have a student this year. And I said, well, you could have told me that. <laughs> Either way, I heard more about this professor later on. And it turns out she actually is not a good advocate for her students. And I'll tell you at the time, and the reason I'm saying this is because these things happen. I felt like a failure. I really did. And things like this happen where it's just not going to plan. You know, I had it all worked out. I worked my butt off to get to where I was. I knew where I wanted to go. It wasn't happening. But looking back, those things, working as a substitute teacher and a tutor, not going to the PhD program were the best things that ever happened to me in my professional career, period. The things I learned as a substitute teacher, invaluable. I learned classroom management. That's huge, huge for what I ended up doing, huge. I got to meet so many different teachers. I came into so many different classrooms. Like Christina said, from kindergarten, I actually stopped at seventh grade. I actually preferred elementary school. I didn't want them high schoolers. I didn't, but <laughs> I love the little kids, but I taught all over and I saw the, the sub notes and the ways teachers were doing things and the different strategies that they did. And I loved it, but I didn't necessarily want to be a teacher. There was something else that I wanted. I still loved archeology. span I loved archeology. span There was something there that was pulling me in. And eventually I got back into CRM. I got hired for far Western and I worked as a cultural resource monitor standing next to a backhoe while they were digging, looking for anything that could be culturally significant. I also washed and labeled artifacts. So here I was whole staring and washing and writing on rocks, writing super teeny tiny on these rocks. And it hit me. I didn't love this. I didn't even like this. Truthfully, I hated it. The construction workers I worked with, they used to tease me. They're like, so you got your degrees in this? I'm like, yeah, my degrees in whole staring. That's what I do. And of course, you know, the money you don't get paid very well, just truthfully, that is what it is. One of the foremen, he asked me, you know, a lot of cool stuff. Maybe I'll be an archeologist. How much do you make? And I told him and he laughed and said, no, I'm good. So that's what it is.
Now, I was at, I was talking with a colleague of mine, and we were both commiserating because these experiences with CRM isn't just me, it's everyone I know in CRM, truthfully. But we were both talking, we were both commiserating that we really, this wasn't what we loved. We love archaeology, but this isn't what we love. And I said to her, if there's any type of archaeology I could do, it would be public archaeology. And as soon as I said it, I thought, why am I saying it and not doing it? And that was it. I came home, I did some research, and I said, hey, San Diego, California has a lot of museums. I came to my fiance, now husband, and said, you want to move to San Diego? There's museums for me to work at. And he said, yeah, actually, I've always wanted to move to San Diego. Let's do it. <laughs> I married a good dude, I'll tell you that. We took about a year to get everything ready. I reached out to all the museums there. Nothing super cheesy. I didn't send out my resume or anything. I just introduced myself. Hi, my name is Kara Ratner. I'm moving out to San Diego. I'm an archeologist. I just love to introduce myself. Um, somebody actually reached back and it was the executive director of a small archeology span museum. And she said, yeah, I actually would like to meet you. We came out there, I met her and I met the education director too. And uh, I found out later there was stuff going on between the two of them. Uh, the education director ended up leaving and I got a call uh, saying, hey, do you want the job? <laughs> do you want to be the education director? I said, yes, please sign me up. So um, my husband and I, we got married, went on our honeymoon and moved to San Diego from Las Vegas in a month. We just did it all. Uh, later we joke when we tell people about it, we're like, we're really stupid for doing all that at once. But looking back, I actually really think it's great. We ripped the bandaid off. We did it all at once and I, Looking back, I realized I had my, my maiden name was Connolly. So all of the professors know me Kara Connolly. Everyone in Nevada knew me as Kara Connolly, the student, the young archeologist. When I moved, I changed my last name, Kara Ratner. And moving, I suddenly had a new identity. I was a professional. Everyone there immediately, I wasn't some student. I was somebody uh, that people listened to. They, they had, I had experience and they wanted to know. What's it like doing desert archaeology? Wow, you worked CRM, now you're working in a museum. And I worked at the archaeological center. I was the education director. I had a number of different interns, a lot that I'm still in very uh, I close contact with. We talk all the time. Some of them even still work in museums. And you know, when I come with my kids, they let me come in for free. So I'm like, yay. <laughs> but either way, uh, it was fun. I got to be in charge of all the public programming. I was doing um, adult programs, community outreach, marketing events, uh, all the different events, and my favorite, the kids programs. I started creating all these different kid programs and writing curriculum, and I was going into classrooms and running field trips, and I loved it. And what also happened is I was really good at it. I actually found out I was really good at writing curriculum. I loved it, I was excited about it. I'd be sitting in my car driving, and suddenly the idea of how to create a mapping curriculum I could tie it into engineering and math. Oh, it's a STEAM program here. And I would just come up with this whole way of doing it. One day I'm driving and I just started thinking about experimental archeology span and I can do rock art. The kids will make rock art. I'll get grinding materials and I'll bring in the different things and they'll grind up the things and they'll mix it up and then they'll paint paper rocks, sometimes real rocks, depending on if I felt like going in the neighborhood and stealing rocks, whatever it was, I love doing it. And my big mission, which I thought about, was I never actually taught archaeology. Here I am teaching archaeology. I'm not teaching archaeology. I was teaching kids to think like an archaeologist. That was my big mission. Inferencing. As an archaeologist, as a scientist, making inferences was the most important thing that I did. So teaching the kids to do that, well, that's actually the most important part. So I never had closed-ended programs, everything hands-on, everything inferencing, everything just touching, very tangible, all the things. I did programs on the title of the program, observation and inferencing. I bring in a bunch of materials that kids are not familiar with, some of them artifacts, some of them from different cultures, and I pass them out. I let the kids touch them, move them, manipulate them, make observations about them in order to infer what they are, how they were made, what they were used for, their cultural you know, importance, all of those things, just like an archeologist does. I even brought dig bins in. Bring the dig bins in, have the kids first come up with research questions. Were there children at the site? Then they had to think of their hypotheses. 
if there were children at these sites, then we'd expect to find, and of course you get toys, small furniture, and then one child one time said, baby teeth. That one impressed me. That I was like, brilliant, brilliant, baby teeth. So once we had that, then they get to excavate, find the artifacts, document them, draw them, and then create their own stories about what happened at these sites. I never gave an answer. I let them come up with it, just like a true archaeologist. And that was my big mission. So it really wasn't teaching. It wasn't teaching history. It wasn't teaching. This is what archaeologists think. It was teaching them to think. Not only did, and I loved it. I loved it. And they were, I guess, pretty good programs because they got really popular. I had a lot of people, a lot of schools requesting it, and I was busy, busy, busy. It got to the point when I was working at the archaeological center that the director, she wanted to go in a different direction. She really, honestly, I think it was a personal thing. She didn't like children, but she wanted to go really with the adult programs. And while there is value in that, I saw the potential in the children's programs. She didn't see it and she didn't want to go in that direction. It was at that point I came to my husband and I, you know, he knew things were going, how they were going at my work. I loved what I was doing, but not where I was working. And he said to me, so why don't you do it for yourself? And I said, you can't do that. No, you need to work for a place. And he said, why? And I said, I, I don't know. I guess you don't. So I did. I went off and created Archaeology for Kids in 2016. Uh, I reached out to the schools I'd worked at and told them my exciting news. Uh, started building up a lot of business, a lot of schools. I was teaching um, in, pro in uh, classroom programs, after school programs, and my own summer camps had two educators working for me and they were pretty fantastic. And I was doing that for about three years and uh, had, as a personal thing in 2017, had my first baby, little Ariella. And it, my husband with his flexible schedule, he actually could watch her while I was teaching. And then it got to the point though where I was teaching and all I wanted to do was be home with her. And when he was home with her, all he wanted to do was be working. <laughs> and I went, what are we doing here? So in the end of 2019, I actually put my business on hold and I was pregnant with my second, another little girl. And I decided to put it on hold um, and be home with my girls. And the plan now, because I am home with my daughters and it worked out, honestly, with the pandemic, everything happening, my business wouldn't, wouldn't be lasting right now. It wouldn't. Schools were closed. I mean, even right now, they're not bringing in enrichment programs. <laughs> Nobody's having, you know, after school programs, summer camps, ugh, that's even iffy. So really, there really wasn't a business at the moment. So it actually worked out timing wise, very good that I had my second baby and decided to be home. I'm actually planning as soon as my girls are old enough to be in school, and I have a little bit more time to myself. I'm actually turning going to be turning one of my most popular programs into a children's book series. Archaeo it's going to be trash detectives, or the titles in the works. But either way, it's getting kids to think like a scientist, thinking like an archaeologist. It's going to be a workbook and it's designed for third through fifth grade students. And right now I'm doing my research by buying a ton of children's books, which my husband says, enough books, but you can never have enough children's books is my motto. So that's the plan. Now, I do want to share a few takeaway points here. Anthropology, it's a very unique degree. And there may not be a job waiting for you like there would be with business or education, but that's okay. That's okay. You just need to know the game you're playing. You know, if you love it, go for it. Just go for it with your eyes open. The jobs in archeology span are not what we really, may not be typically what we love about the field. CRM, long hours, low pay, and sometimes dangerous situations. I actually know of two archeologists who have died while doing field work. And I look back at some of the things that I did and I was young and stupid and was told to do it and told, hey, if you don't do this, you're gonna get fired and there's 10 other people who want your job. And I look back and go, my God, that was dangerous. I really put myself or I let them put me in dangerous situations and that's not okay, but that's CRM. And you are always expendable. Um, there's no job security, regardless of how valuable you are. And Everyone I've talked to actually has a similar experience. Now, there's opportunities out there, but you'll need to be creative about it. I realized in my 10 years in the field, uh, I needed to utilize more of my skills than just anthropology to be happy and successful. I found my niche. 
Write down what you love, what you're good at, things you don't love. Just make a list without any job in mind. Once you're done, read it back to yourself. Now figure out how to either get this job or make this job. I made this list. I realized I loved archaeology and I love sharing it with others, especially with children. That's why I use my you know, background in education and writing curriculum and teaching in front of a class to create archaeology for kids. And it's actually my real life experience as an archaeologist and my degrees that gives me credibility. Now, if you don't want to work in one of the traditional areas, you need to make yourself marketable and find your niche. My goal is just to help you go into this field with your eyes open. It can be an amazing field with amazing opportunities, but you'll need to work harder and more creatively than in other fields. Maybe after this first seminar, you decide to take some courses in education or dance or foreign language or whatever that cross section is for you to complement your anthropology degree. Or maybe you want to go in one of the traditional paths of archaeology, and that's great too. But just be aware, as Dean, as Christina said, go into different things, look into different avenues, find what makes, what find your niche, because that's what you need to do. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kara, and the booming voice from above. There we go. Thank you, Heather. Uh, catching the echo. Thank you for, uh, once again, sage advice. This is a terrific panel. So given the timing now, we're 1221, we're going to go to 1235, then we'll have to, to cut it. Um, but there probably won't be time, it looks like, for Q&A. At the same time, I didn't want to interrupt any of our three speakers because we get such rare opportunities to hear the perspectives you're all sharing. I did not want to interrupt. Um, so with that, we'll go to 1235, and I'll hand it over to Natasha as our fourth and final speaker and thanks again to each of you thus far as we uh, hear from Natasha now. All right, um, can everyone hear me? Perfect, I have a small little PowerPoint. It's just a couple of slides to, cut, to guide the presentation. So I'm gonna share screen. Okay. All right, can everyone see? Perfect. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Natasha Tawisi. Um, I'm very excited to be here and share my background and some tips with you all. It's great to really see how everyone like basically turned their BA into something that they're doing that they enjoy and love um, because you can do a lot of stuff with anthropology, which I think a lot of you are now beginning to realize or have known already that it's, it's, a, it's a great field because it's a great foundational field. Um, so I guess to start off, um, I just wanted to start off with graduation from UNLV. I earned my Bachelor of Anthropology um, in 2017 with a minor in biology. Um, and it's actually funny because um, I guess like my role in, well, my pathway <laughs> into anthropology was very similar to Dean. I actually started off at UNLV as pre-med as well. Um, and I think within like two, three weeks, I also switched to anthropology. <laughs> I just figured it was not for me um, pretty early on. I think I romanticized a lot about what um, pre-med was and everything. And once I got into undergrad, I was like, there's no way I can do medical school or anything like that. But I did kept it as my minor, which is what I have and minor in biology. So um, after graduation, I moved to Portland, Oregon and worked at a startup nonprofit as an AmeriCorps VISTA member. Um, and here I got to work with uh, the organization was a one man kind of like deal. The executive director was also the founder, who was also my supervisor. And I was the only person there in the organization. And I worked um, from like a capacity building kind of way where I did a lot of stuff like research funding opportunities for the school. I didn't work with the students too much, but I worked a lot with just trying to figure out ways for them to grow as an organization. And I worked a lot with recruiting board members as well for the board of directors and kind of like just networking my way through Portland with other nonprofits, which there were plenty of in Portland. And um, so AmeriCorps is a long year, um, a year long commitment. So after I finished, I moved to Lesotho and worked with the Peace Corps as an adolescent health and HIV and AIDS specialist. Um, these two pictures here is of Lesotho. Um, if you haven't heard of Lesotho or know where it is, it's a landlocked country, a very small landlocked country in South Africa. And it's 
very beautiful. <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy how beautiful it was. And it's, it's such a small country that like I'm a lot of people don't know about it. And the climate is actually very similar to Colorado, which is where I am now. And I have to say it is very similar when it's dry there. <laughs> So um, basically in Lesotho, I worked um, half time with the community and half in the HIV clinic. Um, I worked with my counterparts and host country nationals that I met to create after school programs that were focused on health, um, health topics and just HIV because Lesotho has one of the highest prevalence um, of HIV in the world. Um, and um, they're in, they have a lot of need in that aspect. Um, and at the HIV clinic, I, I got to work with um, like different departments, but mostly within the HIV clinic. Um, that particular year I was in Lesotho, the country itself was rolling out a new um, online database. So until then, most clinics, um, except for some hospitals, everything is on paper. Um, and this was just a couple of years ago, and they were rolling out a new program um, with, uh, it's called ICAP. It's a partnership with the Columbia University. And they basically sent all these representatives to different districts in Lesotho and to start with transferring these paper files to patient, um, to electronic. And that's just to help strengthen the health systems that are within Lesotho. Um, it is a pretty rural country, so it was a very slow process to begin with. But I had the opportunity to um, help clinic staff and their leadership um, team with kind of transferring. And since um, even if I didn't have experience with the system itself, it was pretty intuitive. So I got to learn it pretty quickly and help train staff on how to intake information and things like that. So that was actually really cool to see. Um, it was a great experience just to kind of look at health systems um, that are like that versus like the states. Um, and here, um, as Peter had mentioned, because of COVID, um, I was only there for a year and a half. It is a 27 month commitment, um, but um, because of COVID, um, all the volunteers around the world, all the Peace Corps volunteers, we were evacuated back to the states due to just safety reasons and borders closing. Um, it was a pretty crazy year, as I'm sure you know from COVID. It was pretty wild, <laughs> but it was abrupt. But I mean, what what can you do? Um, so after um, that, I moved back to Vegas in 2020, which was earlier last year. And I um, worked at the health department, the Southern Nevada Health Department, as an environmental health specialist in their food operations program. It was kind of on a whim. Um, I think in, in Lesotho, I figured out that I wanted to um, work in global health um, or public health, like just within that area. Um, and I found a job listing on the health department and saw their environmental health specialist program. And I had the qualifications for it thanks to my bio background because it is a very, very science heavy field, which I was surprised with, but um, glad I did it. But um, I was with their food operations program. And here it was another very interesting field where I inspected a lot of food facilities and things like that, as well as investigated a lot of foodborne illness outbreaks during that time. Um, and I really enjoyed it, but, um, I didn't love it. <laughs> so, um, I already knew before prior, like prior to getting this job, I went to go back to school for my master's. And, um, just like a lot of people have mentioned, um, it was very hard to, I had a lot of hard time figuring out what I wanted to do. I, I knew I wanted to go back to school, but I didn't really know what for specifically. I knew it was going to be maybe somewhere in global health. And that's exactly what I did. I applied and I got into um, the University of Colorado at the Anschutz Medical Campus, where I'm a MPH candidate for the Global Health and Epidemiology Department, which I moved to Denver last month for it. Um, I'm also a graduate research assistant at the Department of, um, of Epidemiology, where I work um, with a, it's a project that's um, funded by the CDC to basically collect data on cases that have been that have um, confirmed uh, tests for enteric diseases. So kind of like bouncing back on what I did. And that's something that I've noticed too over my experience is that I kind of take what I like or what I have ex have experienced in and kind of like helping that guide me to find the roles that I am interested or want and kind of just moving along with it to figure out exactly what it is that I want to do. Um, and epidemiology is something that I have been very interested in. Um, still wasn't sure if I wanted to do that, but I'm very happy to be here. I'm also still learning what I like and don't like, and I'm finding out that I really like biostats, which is something that's very surprising. I didn't think that I would like, but just only been a month, but I have enjoyed my biostats um, classes a lot. So we'll see um, where that takes me. 
so I guess like looking back, um, I feel pretty um, grateful for my anthropology degree. I think a lot of um, everyone else had kind of said everything in a very great way. Um, it really builds the foundation for you to have, um, it builds the foundation for you to meet and deal with a lot of different types of people. And I think that that kind of background really helped me when I was traveling abroad as well and um, really opened my eyes to be able to work in um, communities um, with a lot of uh, inaccessibility to health and a lot of disparities and things like that. It just kind of like made you empathetic, but also critically think about the issues that were involved in the area. And um, as some of them, as some of you guys have also mentioned, anthropology also like helped me to look at things a bit more critically. Um, like when I reflect back during my time in Lesotho, um, I would like to do something like that similarly again, but I knew that I didn't have the credentials to be where I was, but which is why I think that um, it helped me to critically look at the impact I was making as a Peace Corps volunteer in a country like Lesotho and wanting to go back um, or doing something similar, but with um, better impact and better understanding of the environment around me and the cultures around me. Um, but yeah, that's like the gist of where <laughs> the past few years have been. Um, and then going back to just uh, going back to now to the present moment, I think my biggest advice, aside from everyone else who mentioned something like all the great things already, is um, some of the advice I'd like to give is just to take your time in school. Oh, let me go to the next one. To take it slow and find out what you like or don't like. As everyone has echoed before, like you are not going to know what you want to do until you think, like until you test it out, like test the waters. Like your four years as undergrad or more is a great time to kind of learn and explore different um, career opportunities and things like that. Um, and then just go from there. Like this is a time of exploration. So take advantage of it. Um, my other advice is just to cultivate re your relationship and expand your network. And this is not just undergrad. This is your whole life. <laughs> It's, it's great to build your network early on and then strengthen those relationships. Um, you might meet people who will lead you in the right direction or those who are doing things that you never thought you wanted to do, but that you're realizing that, hey, like that sounds awesome. I want to do something like that. Um, so you never know who you're going to meet. Okay. And then the other is just to reach out to your favorite faculty right now at UNLV. One of my biggest regret was not being more involved and not reaching out to more of my favorite faculty members and things like that. I think that I could have uh, definitely done that a lot more. And that's one of the biggest thing I like recommend to everyone is just to talk to your professors and anyone there, they want to help you. So just reach out to them. My other thing is to attend events, whether that's in person or virtually, like right now, this is a great opportunity. Um, I didn't get to do something like this, but I feel like sometimes when I attend some random event that is a little bit related to what I wanna do, but not kind of, I've met some really great people that way. Um, I think at UNLV, I attended a lot of like study abroad programs um, areas the first year and I got to go study abroad for a semester in Ghana and kind of like build more on what I wanted to do later on in life. So you, you like I said, you never know. <laughs> so just use this time to really figure out what you like and don't like. And it's okay if you don't like something because now you've tried it and now you know. Um, and then let's see. But yeah, like anthropology is a very cool, diverse area. It's a great foundation for a lot of different types of um, career, whether that's in education or in public health or really anything it really gives you an up i think um to figure out what you want to do and how to deal with different people and of diverse backgrounds and things like that um but i have my email here if you have any questions at all whether that's with um the america Corps pro program or peace corps or just kind of figuring out what you want to do um you feel free to email me here and yeah thank you also this picture is from the uh a national holiday in lesu too is with the clinic staff that i worked with on the daily we're just in our traditional outfit <laughs> but it was probably the last the week before i had was evacuated so it holds a special place in my heart but yeah thank you everyone well thank you thank you dean christina kara and natasha for sharing your time your experiences your stories and your advice this has been fantastic uh we won't be able to take questions but what you've done, I think, is give all, given all of us plenty to think about and plenty to inspire us. And it's just wonderful, just absolutely wonderful 
to hear everything you've shared today. So a huge thank you again. We'll have a video eventually on the department YouTube site and we'll coordinate with each of you speakers with a, a, a thank you we'd like to share with you subsequently. And you can also share with your, your students, family and friends uh, the outcome of today too with the video. But thank you all. This has been fantastic. We're incredibly appreciative. Take care, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your Monday.